Good morning, Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your Hurricane Outlook and discussion for Monday, the 7th of August, 2017. The top story, obviously, is Tropical Storm Franklin here in the Atlantic Basin, and we're going to go over that pretty much as the sole topic of conversation for today. Real quick, the 8 a.m. intermediate advisory information indicating that winds are 50 miles per hour, the minimum pressure down to 1,004, and it's moving west-northwest at about 13 miles per hour over the northwest Caribbean Sea. This is what the National Hurricane Center track map looks like, and you can see that it heads towards the Yucatan and then over the southwest Gulf of Mexico, Bay of Campeche, and finally making landfall uh, fairly far to the south of the Tampico area in along the western Gulf here. And that would happen sometime, it looks like, on Thursday, unless it speeds up a little bit, then it could be before nightfall on Thursday. We'll see. Uh, this is a different perspective. This is from our uh, Hurricane Track Insider site, our storm, storm Pulse map that we are able to use. And I want to give you an idea of where this is located in relation to some other areas. Uh, a lot of interest here in the Belize area. So there's Belize City. And Franklin is pretty much the center of circulation due east of Belize City right now. So I do not think this will have much impact on the Belize City area in particular. And certainly farther to the south uh, and even along the coast of Honduras here, not too much of an issue from Franklin as it moves in over the next 12 hours or so. And in fact, because of the onshore flow, the counterclockwise flow, you know, up here towards Cozumel, uh, maybe some adverse weather headed your way in some of these bands, especially since Franklin appears to be getting a little bit larger in its coverage, its aerial coverage. We'll look at that more in detail in just a moment. And then you can see this track here off to the west and west-northwest into the Gulf. There's Tampico there. So this should come in a little bit farther to the south then Tampico, which is good news for them between Veracruz and Tampico, but probably going to be bad news, I guess that goes without saying, for whomever this impacts in between the two areas, these two larger population centers. And if we zoom in, you get an idea of the rugged terrain. That's what's so neat about this map. And so this should die away very quickly once it's inland, but this orographic lift through here, Definitely, you're going to have the risk of some mudslides. Very heavy rain is going to work its way in. This is an, an increasingly large system. If we look at the visible animation here, just after the sun comes up, you notice a couple of things of importance. First, as I mentioned, it's getting larger, taking advantage of a larger overall umbrella of which to work under. And that's important. If it's restricted uh, by the upper level winds and the moisture, then it'll be much smaller. And so this is taking advantage of several important factors, not only in the atmosphere, but in the way the atmosphere is interacting with the very warm Northwest Caribbean Sea. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things we can look at in this imagery. You can clearly see the outflow with the system very well established over here on the Southeast side, especially uh, even looks like a little bit of a channel developing there, getting that air that's coming in at the center counterclockwise once it gets up well well above the, uh, the I almost called it a hurricane the tropical storm it goes out in a clockwise fashion and uh, that outflow spreading out evenly in the upper levels of the atmosphere as in the lower levels of the atmosphere uh, the air is streaming in right towards that center of circulation and it's definitely getting better organized unfortunately there hasn't been any recon into this system yet, but that will change this afternoon when the hurricane hunters head down there and investigate what's going on, the water temperatures in here. We're going to look at that in a moment. Very, very warm as this starts to develop what looks like a central dense overcast or this solid core area through here. Hopefully it's not too rapid uh, so that the folks up here where this would make landfall are not caught by a strengthening hurricane and right now it's at 50 miles per hour and it still has a good 12 hours to go if not more before landfall and that is ample opportunity for strengthening 
uh, over the very warm water here, especially when I see this right here, this little tail right here. That's That tells me this is definitely undergoing some strengthening. And if we look at the analysis from the University of Wisconsin site, clearly you can see in the upper levels of the atmosphere this uh, outflow that's going on. No question about that. You also notice upper level low sitting over here and what's left of Invest Area 99L. Really not going to worry about this too much. Uh, I did not say we will ignore it, but we're not going to worry about it too much. It's still going to be a trackable feature, and it'll end up somewhere in the southwest Atlantic, uh, the southwest North Atlantic Basin, to be specific. And, yeah, you never know. That's why you don't ignore these things entirely. So the upper ocean heat content, very important here. Um, one of the things we do at HurricaneTrack.com is we are able to plot the forecast, the current position, and the forecast track of each system over these uh, upper ocean heat content maps that we get from NOAA and the AOML site. And these are updated every few days. This is the latest one from the 5th of August. So we'll probably get a new one here in the next couple of days or so, hopefully even today. But it doesn't change that dramatically unless a system passes over it. Uh, these warm waters. So what are we looking at? Well, very, very high upper ocean heat content all the way up to landfall along the Yucatan. And what does that mean? It means the water temperature is not warm just at the surface, but that extends fairly deep below the surface. So uh, as the storm goes along here and churns up the water and it wind whips the waves, it's just whipping up more warm water from below. And the entire circulation of Franklin is passing over this very warm water here. It's not just the core, but the entire circulation, especially the northern part. And that's going to move into the Yucatan area. And that'll bring just incredible amounts of rainfall, easily a foot of rain in some locations. And that's going to really aid in its strengthening. And we will look at what it looks like in the Gulf of Mexico later after this crosses the Yucatan, I'll show you what the potential is in the Gulf. In the meantime, the anomalies, the departures from normal, and this updated just recently here uh, from the National Hurricane Center site, this is your anomaly map, and this is, this is in degrees Celsius. First of all, let me point out that the deep tropics here are still running well above normal, in some cases a degree Celsius above normal uh, throughout the main development region. And then look at this, as coincidental as it may seem, this whole area right through here where Franklin's going to traverse one degree Celsius above the long-term average. So the water temperatures are not only warm, but they are warmer than they usually are uh, for this time of year. So that's going to aid in development as well. Looking at the various models and what they show, first of all, completely disregard this one. That is the climatology and persistence. Just forget it. It's not even, I don't even know why it's still plotted, but whatever. It is not going up towards the Texas coast. I would say there is 0% chance of that. And the reason is there's just enough mid-level ridging down here. This is not exactly accurate as to what the shape of it is and the placement. But the idea is that there is a denser air mass sitting over here that will steer Franklin around almost in a curved fashion uh, instead of a trough. Uh, in other words, if we had a, a ridge sitting over here and a ridge over the western Atlantic and a deep trough digging in like this, it could pull Franklin to the north, but that's not happening. That typically does not happen in early August. If it were later in the month and into September, then that would be a different story. You would get these height falls over the Texas area where you have troughiness coming in uh, from the Midwest, and that tends to open up a hole for these things to come north. Well, that's not going to happen this time around. And again, Tampico is up here, and a lot of the modeling taking it well to the south of Tampico. So between Tampico and Veracruz is a good bet. Also a good bet, I'm of the opinion that this will become a hurricane, not because I have some kind of an argument or a disagreement with the National Hurricane Center. It is because this is over very warm water, and I know for a fact that Intensity forecasting is where there is the least amount of skill 
not only from the human beings that forecast these things, but also from the limitations in computer models. It's just very difficult to gauge what's going on in the core of tropical cyclones and how fast they can change. And we have seen rapid intensification with systems in this area in the past, and so logic would dictate that it'll be stronger than the guidance is suggesting, especially since the global models seem to have really not done very well with intensity this year. Granted, they have really overdone it, but the bottom line is that the Euro and the GFS, the ECMWF, the Euro, as an example, with Nauru over in the West Pacific, both of those models, the GFS and the European, uh, the ECMWF, were forecasting just ridiculously strong intensities for Nauru, and that never came to pass. It was off by you know, anywhere from 40 to 80 to 90 millibars in terms of the pressure forecast. I think at 1.907 from the European and 872 or some just unbelievable historic low number from the GFS, and they busted tremendously way, way, way too strong. And you say, well, Mark, if they were too strong, why are you thinking that this will become stronger than the guidance? It's simply because the models just haven't done a good job, period, with intensity. And, man, you saw what the GFS has done this year. Then why would it be reliable, especially since a lot of this modeling, uh, enough of it in here, some of it is statistical modeling and the others are dynamic-based, etc., uh, a lot of it's based off the GFS background, and I just don't trust it. Not this year, um, and so I think it's going to probably be a solid Category 1 hurricane uh, along the landfall in Mexico between Veracruz and Tampico, and maybe a, a hurricane as it makes landfall along the Yucatan. That also would not surprise me. So let's talk about what's going to happen later today. Around 4.30 Eastern Time, I'm going to start a live broadcast on YouTube, and I will be here to discuss the 5 o'clock Eastern Time advisory package. The advisories come out normally every six hours, and then you're going to have intermediate advisories every three hours between the main advisory packages. And so what I'm going to do, I'll come in, I'll do an introduction, you know, I will be on camera, etc., in front of the laptop here. And then I'll have a series of graphics loaded up like I do now. And we'll go over those, but it'll be live. And then, between the advisory packages, I'm not just going to sit here twiddling my thumbs. You know, I have other stuff to do. But I'm going to leave the stream going, and I will periodically change what you're looking at. It might be a satellite image, the floater. It might be radar. We know that... Um, Probably Brian McNulty from the University uh, of Miami down there uh, is going to set up that long radar loop. Uh, and there may be other interesting things that I can put in and change every 30 minutes to an hour. And then at the intermediate advisories and at the main advisory times, I'll be back. So a simple way to put it, starting at 4.30, live, you'll see me, we'll talk about it. The 5 o'clock Eastern Advisory Package will come out. We will dissect it, figure out what we need to talk about related to it. Then I'll be back at near 8 o'clock Eastern Time, and then again near 11 p.m. Eastern Time, and then probably near 2 a.m. Eastern Time when it presumably at that point makes landfall. And then after that, we're done with the live broadcast, and we'll wait and presumably do it again uh, sometime on Thursday. All right? So I think that'll be interesting. We can chat about it on the YouTube chat. Our subscribers to our Hurricane Track Insider site will also be able to uh, chat, and we can post all kinds of interesting things, and we'll see what happens. I think it'll be a neat sort of play-by-play, -play, color commentary as to what's going on as this approaches the Yucatan. So 4.30 Eastern Time, and then for probably eight hours or more, uh, we'll go from there. All right, so have a great rest of your morning. I am Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll see you again around 4.30 this afternoon when we go live.